Dr. C, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. No problem. So if uh, if you don't mind introducing yourself a little bit to the audience, just kind of letting people know your background a little bit uh, before we get into the topic, which are peptides. Sure. Um, well, I guess first and foremost, I like to say I'm a I'm an awesome father. Got three boys that I raised that, um, you know, it's all about raising your kids and then hanging out with them the rest of your life. And I think I've done a good job with that. And um, and then I'm a physician. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, sports train, joint train. But my real expertise is cellular medicine and um, specifically to you know what makes up the biochemistry molecular biology quantum physics of the cell and how do you optimize it how do you keep it in, in check and how can i utilize all that knowledge to help my patients and help myself to keep up with my kids so it it, it just kind of circles around all of that and optimizing what i can do um, for people that have issues you know metabolic issues immune issues cancer um, and optimizing performance so it all kind of circles around knowledge of the cell and i've just been fortunate to been doing that for 40 years and uh i'm 61 um and i walk the talk uh, i'm all about training and optimizing cellular health excellent okay so um talk to us a little bit about peptides I i'd say over the last i don't know uh, probably came on our radar over the last 10 years but really over the last five years We've heard a lot about peptides and their benefits and, and uh, how they're being used. More recently, um, we've been using some peptides and have noticed some pretty amazing benefits. And of course, we're being monitored uh, by a doctor, which I think is probably what you would recommend as well. But what are peptides and how do they fit in the, I guess, in the medical market? Um, because I, I know you, some people can get them online without necessarily having to go through a doctor like... Let's start with peptides in general. What are they? And then let's get into, I guess, uh, how they're available and what they do. Sure. Um, so peptides are, are basically um, amino acids that are, are combined from, it, it's a combination of amino acids that are either connected in straight lines, helixes, circles, whatever you want to call, you know, the, the amino acid sequence, it's basically a signaling agent that is in this context of what we're referring to and what we're, what, how this all started is the context of these are signaling agents that the body's familiar with. It's how cells communicate. It's how, um, communication between organs um it's basically the understanding of how cells talk to each other to optimize or adapt to the environment and so peptides really um i i was i actually so so i introduced peptides about eight years ago in in the context of teaching uh, to physicians to understand really we just, I brought peptides out as just a basis of understanding molecular pathways because they were familiar to people. We had some of them that we were utilizing in, in treatments and modalities, and then it just exploded. Um, and so I, I think, I think now it's just amazing to see where it's gone. Um, when basically the whole context of starting the discussion of peptides was to really teach people about molecular pathways in cells and how they communicate. It just seemed like the logical step to take, uh, to understand that peptides are just natural signaling agents that the body's familiar with and thereby having less side effects, less issues with tolerance or um, resistance to the receptors. Uh, it, it just made sense to start with that and uh, go from there to to start teaching about the utilization of these signaling agents. What's up, everybody? It's launch week for the new MAPS Anabolic Advanced program. It's a brand new program. Brand new program. People are super excited about it. I'm going to give one away for free. Here's how you can win free access. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel 
and turn on notifications. If we think you should win, we'll let you know in the comment section. You'll get free access to the brand new program that everybody's talking about, Maps Anabolic Advanced. Now, everybody else, it's launch week, so it's on sale. It'll normally be priced at $157, but you can get it right now for $97. Plus, we'll throw in two free eBooks, each one valued at $47 each. The first eBook is Advanced Training Techniques. The second one is the Carb Cycling Diet. So $97 gets you the brand new Maps Anabolic Advanced program, plus those two free eBooks. This launch season ends February 26th. If you're interested, go to anabolicadvanced.com and use the coupon code AA60 for the discount plus the free eBooks. All right, here comes the show. What were some of the original peptides that hit the market? And when they did, uh, did you kind of see the writing on the wall? Did you know that it was going to explode like it has? Was it was it obvious the direction it was going? Oh, absolutely. I mean, so what people don't know is when I first started lecturing eight years ago, I'd ask the audience, physicians, I'd say, so how many of you are using peptides? Nobody raised their hand. And I said, well, does anybody use insulin? Insulin's a peptide. It's, it's one of the first incredible signaling agents that we've ever, it changed life. It changed life as we know it. And that just using that starting point to indicate the, the significance of the signaling agents was, was, it was a great way to capture at least my audience at the beginning. And, and so, I mean, um, so we, we've had, you know, insulin, oxytocin, vasopressin, we've had all of these peptides around for 80 years. Um, they've just been progressing in knowledge of synthesizing some of these peptides that we have, and then being able to utilize them, study them, and look at the, you know, clinical significance. Um, and it's, you know, it's exploded into um <laughs> hundreds if not thousands of peptides that we're familiar with right now that have clinical relevance you said something mm. really interesting that that caught my attention you said that they are signaling agents that the body's already familiar with in other words peptides are um, based off of signaling compounds that we already have in the body is this what makes them different than drugs like what, what's the difference between a drug that let's say agonizes a receptor or antagonizes a receptor versus a peptide? Well, yeah, so in this context, uh, the, so we can make any peptide. Uh, a peptide can be any combination of amino acids. So we can make anything. The library is infinite. But if we look in the body, the human body, and we look at how cells communicate how does a mitochondria communicate with the nucleus? How does a nucleus communicate with the uh, mitochondria, the peroxisome, the Golgi bodies, that all the things that make up proteins? Well, they do it through peptides. And peptides are basically, they're, they're in and out of the body pretty quickly. They're signaling agents that could be there for seconds. They could be there for a couple of minutes um, and some longer. Um, and, and that's where science has gone to where we can keep them around longer. That's why they're more relevant now, because we can make them hang around to do their job when we introduce them exogenously, meaning by pill form, nasal form, injectable form, transdermal form, whatever. But the, the significance is that the cell is familiar with the signaling agent, so it doesn't see it as a foreign Mm. Um, as some kind of foreign process of where we're forcing a cell to do something it does not want to do. These are all agents that allow a cell to use its intelligence, which is incredible and will never have that intelligence. It lets the cell have its own ability to utilize these signaling agents then to make decisions you know, as far as adaption, you know, like you guys are, you, you guys are all about exercise and so forth. So what is exercise and what are you trying to do? You're always trying to have the muscle adapt to the environment of what you're presenting. And these peptides just help that signaling and communication between cells become more efficient. And at the same time, utilize substrates like glucose, fatty acids, um, proteins, 
in a more flexible pattern so we can optimize glycolysis or oxidative phosphorylation or fat oxidation when it's needed. So we're not forcing a cell to make a decision with a drug. We're giving the cell its intelligence to make amazing decisions when they need to be made. So you get so with something like this, is it safe to say that you would you would see less of a uh, potential negative feedback loop or a tolerance or receptor down regulation or you know some of the ways that the body adapts to drugs where you tend to build a tolerance or you tend to your body almost adapts and it starts to become you know you need more to get the same effect you end up with more side effects do, do peptides so, do less of that you well so that what you've indicated is basically when you get something that is is hanging around too long or something that's there that is not physiological okay that you're you're introducing something that's non-physiologic typically with all of these peptides we're introducing signaling that's physiologic to get a physiologic response not a super physiologic response oh. so so we're we're introducing something that will not cause inceptor involution um will not cause um immune reactions will not cause tolerance will not cause um it, it's again it's if you use these correctly and you understand how to use them and you know the signaling of the cell it's it's pretty straightforward with just letting again the cell make the decision on really how is it going to utilize a substrate and how is it going to make atp and nad and it really comes down to that into energy so that, that's really it and that's what's so phenomenal about now and the craze of where we're going especially pharmaceutical companies now their focus is on peptides because mm -hmm. they're natural they're they don't have to do a, a they don't have to find the mechanisms because we already know them. It's now let's synthesize them. That's where this is going. So this is why it's exploding and less money has to be spent, less research, less, and, and then less uh, side effects. Side effects is the big deal with this because again, body familiar with signaling. Now, in terms of um, so the hormone space and, and exogenous hormones, um, the potential for peptides in terms of uh, being able to signal the body to produce um, this balance and, and get your hormones kind of up to together naturally um, is that their potential there in terms of less side effects, less uh, um, dependency on, you know, exogenous hormones and like kind of being able to, to pursue that uh, instead. Uh, okay. That's a loaded question, and, <laughs> but it's a great question. It's a great question because there's so much there that we could, I could talk to you about five hours straight about. So oh, okay. let, let's just jump in and say, okay. Hormone, hormone supplementation tends to always be super physiologic. Um, so I don't care what anybody tells you. I don't care what anybody says out there. It's the, it, it is a fact and it's difficult to monitor and keep. If you are supplementing with some type of androgen or hormone, it's very hard um, to, to number one, to keep it in a physiologic range. Um, for the most part, because the, the the patient or the person always wants more, right? It, it, especially in muscle building and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll tell you, and uh, let me back up and say that peptides, um, depending on what you're trying to uh, help the cell work with, and that is typically efficiencies. Efficiencies are in mitochondria nucleus, DNA, transcription, all these things that we do to make a cell smarter and better, well, that leads to improved testosterone production, improved growth hormone production, improved mm -hmm. IGF-1 production, all the things that are important in particular in, in what you're potentially interested in, in muscle building and recovery and, and restoration of function after training. It's It comes down to really efficiencies of the cell. So I can see people that have 
come in and say, hey, doc, I've got low T. I mean, I hear that all the time. And they could be their, their mid-30s, they could be 40s, 50s, but you, there's so many things that can be leading to that low testosterone that may not even be, even low testosterone may not be an indicator that they're having these problems with fatigue and recovery and all the things that go along with that open-ended subject that's tremendous, right? That's huge. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is you got to, you got to look at this from a, from a, a really broad perspective of, look, I, you can take numbers. If you're dealing with a number, then you're, you're done. I, I don't, you're not going to get anywhere making yourself more efficient or, or making, you know, improving the efficiencies of the cell. It's all based on multiple pathways of working to get to a place that has to do with improving acid-based metabolism of the cell, has to do with improving the microbiome of the body, has to do with Oh, you know, the circadian rhythms of your sleep. I mean, there's so many of these factors. I'm sure you guys are all aware of it that come into play with recovery and restoration of function. They have everything to do with the diurnal patterns of testosterone production, estrogen, progesterone, prolactin. I mean, all of these things and, and the master hormone growth hormone. And, and that tends to be if we're on the peptide side of things, that tends to be one of the areas that we really focus on first because of so much of the knowledge of what happens to endogenous growth hormone production, endogenous meaning the anterior pituitary producing your growth hormone. And it cycles it anywhere from three to nine times a day. It's interval pulses are three hours apart. It's all about how can I influence that master hormone potentially in being an influencer on other things like downstream IGF-1, on testosterone production, on other hormones. Um, and, you know, that has to do with age. It has to do with environmental factors. It has to do with stress, um, all kinds of things. So, so those are approaches that are, that can be taken and, and more specifically in elderly uh, individuals, you know, when you reach the 40, 50, 50 years of age, I mean, you're producing at 50 years of age, you're producing almost less than half of the growth hormone you did in your 25 to 30 range. That's a significant amount of growth hormone where the anterior pituitary is, is absolutely able to mechanically produce growth hormone into your hundreds. Hmm. And it's all about understanding what happens during life to influence that production. So, so if you can keep physiologic production of some of these um, hormones that peptides influence. So we're talking about hormones now, you know, we can talk about enzymes, we can talk about DNA transcription, we can talk about RNA transcription, we can talk about any of these things of what these peptides can do to manip not manipulate, but influence a cell and how it decides, you know, to produce like in your testicles to, to produce testosterone. Um, so, you, you know, there, I, I could just keep going. I mean, we, you can talk about gonadotropin releasing hormones. You can talk about kispeptin 54, kispeptin 10. You can talk about a lot of these signaling systems to, or signaling agents to help you depending on where is this person at and what do we think is influencing the, you know, the, the possibilities of why they're, uh, in your case, you know, why are they, why are they not recovering well um why are they fatigued why are they tired why are they you know they're training they're doing all these things they're supposed to be doing why are we not reaching any of these levels why are we not getting the fat loss we want to see so it's it's really just again using the the brilliance of molecular pathways to influence those type of things that make a difference in the cell. Let, let's talk a little bit more about the fat loss side and some of the, the most common challenges that we see and what peptides are you seeing or benefiting that person? So you got a client who's stalling their progress. We, you, we all know that it could be a whole host of things, right? That could be causing that. But where, where are you seeing the, you know, introducing of peptides being most beneficial for that that avatar, that person who's struggling with with fat loss. Yeah, there's one in particular I'm hearing a lot about, uh, semaglutide. I've been reading and hearing a lot about that one. Like, what's what's going on with these and how are they working? Okay. Um, 
Well, let me let me just back up and just let me see if I can set the the lay the platform that then jump into the GLP one receptor agonist you're talking about semiglutide. Um, it, so so fat loss is all about. It really comes down to again to glucose absorption, the utilization of glucose through glycolysis and through the um, through the full oxidative. Uh, respiration, meaning oxidative phosphorylation Krebs cycle to make ATP and NAD. What does all that mean? It just means that as we, um, you know, as we train harder, as we eat poorly, as we environmental factors, whatever they may be, stress, so forth, all these things influence the cell, what was called cell redox and how inflammatory aspects of the cell can then influence um, the way the cell uses what you put into your body, like fat or proteins or glucose. So what happens is the body loses its flexibility. The cells lose the, flex the flexibility to make those decisions of when do I use this substrate to make energy? And so what happens with fat loss is we tend to lose oxidative phosphorylation, meaning the most efficient way we can make energy is by utilizing fat. That's why like ketone esters are the hottest thing in sports um, because it's an, it's, it's just an immediate NAD ATP production that bypasses everything. And it's, it's just incredible. And that's something else we can talk about at some time, but the fat oxidation is so important in the maintenance of the cell and how it produces NAD and ATP. That's like people who take all these supplements and stuff, they just wipe out cell respiration. They take too many people take so many of all this bullshit that just ruins the cell redox state to where they can't lose fat, they can they become insulin resistant, they can't make muscle gains because they think they're doing things to make the cell better because they're taking an antioxidant where there's this small window of how that works. And, you know, a, like always, a little bit of something is good. Too much of something that's good is bad. <laughs> and so, so fat, loss of fat comes down to really just understanding those basics. And then, you know, you know, your fasting, your exercise program, all these things that can be beneficial, but probably the most, you know, in my line of work, what I do to optimize performance and um, and take care of immune diseases and cancer and so forth. You know what my biggest problem is? It's the diet. It's seeing this diet that's high in everybody has this low-grade metabolic acidosis. And a low-grade metabolic acidosis is always going to influence sarcopenia, loss of muscle mass. It's going to decrease fat oxidation. So those are some of the basic things that you have to work on first. And, 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 and then if we get into the peptides, then it's about optimizing fat oxidation. And so how can we do that in a, in a controlled fashion? Well, as I talked about before, endogenous growth hormone is one of the, is, is one of those things that we have a lot of data on and know how we lose it. We know how it's influenced by disease states in particular, low grade metabolic acidosis or insulin resistance. It lowers the amount of growth hormone release. So, we can do things while we're working on a program, right? To influence um, a better nutrition, a better sleep um, and exercise resistance or um, cardio or high intensity interval training. Using those in conjunction with say like a GHRH or GHRP type of peptide, we can influence growth hormone endogenously to release like it should to take advantage of what it does. And that's all about body partitioning, improving fat oxidation, using fat as your main source of energy, letting you store glucose and use it a little bit later. And then getting that mechanism of, there's this mechanism of how insulin influences this, this PIPK, AKT, mTOR pathway of building muscle or building protein, you know, making protein and so forth. So this has an influence. If you're improving efficiencies of the cell, you're going to influence mTOR. You're going to influence that process of protein synthesis. So, so 
at the same time you're losing fat, you want to improve protein synthesis because on that side of it, the more muscle mass you have or the more efficient the muscle mass you have, theoretically, and, and it depends on the type of exercise, you're improving mitochondrial capacity function, optimization. So you're going to utilize energy even better, right? And so you're going to consume, that cell's going to want to consume more energy. So all of a sudden you've got this reserve of muscle, you've lost fat, and you've improved efficiencies of the of the of muscle to where you're you're thriving now on that fat oxidation and so so that's an that's the beginning of you know trying to help people and losing you know five to 15 pounds of and body partitioning basis basically of uh of fat to muscle and then you can get into so then it's gone into you you bring up the GLP-1 receptor agonist like semiglutide. So I started lecturing on that about six years ago on these GLP-1s. And GLP-1s at the time were introduced. We we studied these as neurocognitive type of peptides that were involved in. We were looking at them in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and all of these ways we could improve executive function, cognition, neuro, neuroplasticity. And what we found out is that people were losing weight and in going through the mechanisms, we understood that it had everything to do with improving insulin and improving beta cell function in the pancreas. And then, okay, right on that big pharma jumped on and said, well, diabetes, biggest thing in the world, let's go. And so the focus went off the brain and went right into diabetes. And so we had these incredible peptide agents that have been phenomenal in changing how we treat type 2 diabetes and in fact even some type 1 issues but what was the side effect of these the side effect was weight loss because you were improving with GLP1 receptors so GLP1 receptors like semiglutide you brought up they're all different names but they're all GLP1 receptor agonists they're made in the stomach they're made by a particular cell that produces them based on when food comes into your body and you release this well that gets influenced by disease, fat, all kinds of things. And so all we're doing is introducing more of that peptide to do its job in improving, again, fat oxidation, but it has many other pathways. So I haven't talked about what's wonderful about these peptides is it's not just one pathway. They have pleiotrophic pathways, meaning many ways to get things done efficiently to make a cell better. And in particular, these GLP-1 receptor agonists are just phenomenal with their mechanisms of number one, you know, improving insulin production, but improving beta cell function in the pancreas, improving insulin uh, glucose absorption in the muscle, improving um, and and decreasing muscle atrophy attributes that are there. Um, in the cell of the muscle. So basically they can stop, like they can decrease the effects of myostatin. They can decrease the effects of these muscle ring finger um, proteins and these atrogen ones that are like their, their atrophy type of, of signaling agents that kind of grow as we get fat or as we get any kind of efficiencies we lose, those things become more prominent and it's why you, you lose muscle. So what's amazing with these GLP ones is, as you can, as you lose weight, you're not going to lose muscle mass, and that's incredible. You know that's incredible mm -hmm. if you know how to use them appropriately and and, and efficiently. Do we have pretty good uh, controlled studies where we compare so, uh, somebody who is utilizing this peptide and then those that are not, and like what the muscle, how much muscle one loses versus the other? I mean, do you have? Do we have research around that yet to like really to to substantiate that? Yeah, there's there's massive research. Um, okay, so my, my, muscle mass is always like the last thing where if you don't have the dollars for the studies, right? And there's no and there's no uh, end game for the pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. You're gonna your studies are gonna be limited. That makes sense. So, right. But but but. So all of the research in these peptides has been based, uh, has, 
has significant data on cardiovascular improvements, um, all of the things that we know are relevant in something that can be very healthy for us. So, so let me just eliminate all those questions. I mean, kidney, liver, um, heart. Right now, right now, the you, your your question is great timing because now it's focused on muscle, and and the the data is just coming out of you know where do you start with all the studies? They start in uh, in a single organism, then they go into mice, and then they go into humans. And so now we do, yeah, we do have human data that shows uh, preservation of muscle mass, and it's incredible. Um, it, it's, uh, but we knew this. I mean, we knew this before based on the mechanisms and the pathways, because the pathways never lie. The pathways are always right. So we know if you're activating, for instance, it, it only makes sense that if you're improving insulin sensitivity, and that means you're improving what insulin does in protein synthesis by encouraging this PIP3K, um, AKTP, mTOR pathway, you're, you're going to make muscle or you're going to keep muscle. It's just, you know, it, it, it goes to... Uh, as you guys are familiar, it goes to just the significance of um, the studies done on just stretching and how stretching can keep muscle mass because it releases the signaling agents that influence those atrophy factors or stop myostatin. So, but to answer your question, yes, the studies are are there now and they're they're pro, they're they're progressing because of the importance of having a, a peptide that has such a significance in improving efficiency, but maintaining, you know, the biggest problem we have, and as you guys probably are really familiar with in, in what you do, is as people are getting older, they want to, the best thing you can do is maintain muscle mass. Mm -hmm. And because loss of muscle mass leads to disease, it leads to loss of bone, it leads to everything. And if we can improve that, we can save billions and billions of dollars in healthcare. And so, it's getting there and it's getting better and we've got we've just got more amazing data now to to integrate now that last phase of muscle and they've gone back to the brain now so so we're the research is going more now again on you know alzheimer's and parkinson's and um uh early cognitive dysfunction issues like that interesting because it, with, what's blowing my mind right now is one of the biggest challenges with weight loss is the metabolic adaptation that tends to happen, right? So if you look at studies on cutting calories and increasing activity and less strength training is involved, um, you tend to see muscle loss along with weight loss because the theory is that the body's trying to match energy intake, right? So what you're saying is through these GLP-1 agonist uh, peptides, it's helping the fat loss process but also maintaining your metabolism. In other words, it's, it's, it's keeping the muscle, helping your body burn body fat just by improving its energy utilization, which is, this is remarkable. I, I've, I've never heard it explained that way. And, you know, as a trainer, I trained people for, for two decades. One of the most challenging things, and this was it, like if I could get a person to lose body fat and either build muscle or keep muscle, like I was winning, like that was it right there. So something like this sounds like a, a total uh, breakthrough. Is that how it's being received right now? Is this, cause I'm reading about it like crazy, uh, in particular, the one that I mentioned, uh, uh, semaglutide, is it making waves, uh, like we would, like I would predict or like I would think. Well, I guess it depends on what you're asking. I mean, I mean, let me just, let me break down what you just said really quickly. And just to say that, remember when with all of these weight loss type of diets, um, the most important thing you can do that you have to do is you've got to maintain protein intake. Yes. I mean, if you're not going to maintain protein intake, you're not going to make muscle or it's going to be very difficult to maintain because muscle mass, muscle needs protein. It, you don't, it's not, it's not something muscle makes. So you've got to put it in your body. And and all of, a lot of these diets lead into acid base problems and, and actually low, again, low grade metabolic issues that happen. 
And what happens with that? Well, the body has to compensate and maintain its pH. The way it does it is by taking amino acids from muscle, degrading it to buffer the, 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 acid, the slight acid change, basically the pH change. So that's why people lose muscle mass over time based on, that's why diet is so crucial. And uh, I'm a huge proponent of protein, but but protein, right? Protein that you get in meat or anything like that is basically an acid. So you have to offset those acids with your fruits and vegetables to make sure that you're aligning that diet appropriately, or you have to take things like sodium bicarb or, you know, like Alka-Seltzer Gold, things like that to offset that acid-base balance. So so a lot of times when you're in these problems with people with, with weight loss and losing muscle, you have to address these pH issues or you're you're not going to go far either. So it, you put, you've changed, when you go into these massive, crazy diets, you change metabolism. You're changing things that are, are not potentially efficient for the patient. So you got to be very careful. You got to maintain diet. You've got to maintain protein um, so that they, so that they can meet those, those goals. Um, there's something that, oh, so you said, is this a craze? Well, it's turned out to be for fat loss, but it's done. In, in my opinion, it's nobody really understands. If you don't understand the mechanisms and why are you using it and then how to count. So here's something else. This will be great for you guys. So as you focus more on this and you have clients with this that are utilizing it with their docs and so forth, the issue you're going to see with these GLP-1s is, okay, they improve fat loss. They help maximize oxidation of fat, but they also work in the brain by reducing appetite. So you've got to consider this when you're approaching a patient and you're telling them, well, we got to get more protein in you while we're working on maintaining muscle or even trying to build muscle and lose fat because what are you fighting? You're fighting that person doesn't want to eat. That person doesn't want that So you've got to find what are those avenues then, how do I increase protein and make it easier for that patient? And, you know, I've always found that the easiest way to do that is not through these, you know, whey and casein shakes, because what do those do? They fill you up. They make you, they make you not want to eat afterwards. It's, it's really going to things like egg whites and things that are inexpensive, but you can get massive amount of protein in, you know, in a small amount of, um, uh, liquid or or whatever form so those are just ideas i mean i'm just telling you there's things that you gotta you gotta put together because you're gonna fight that part you're gonna fight that appetite part and and so those people even though the the mechanisms say you can't lose muscle with glp ones well i'm going to tell you you can if you're not maintaining your diet appropriately excellent right that's that's such a i'm so glad you brought that up because when I look back at all the clients that I train with fat loss and to Sal's point that would lose muscle, that is the greatest challenge. Yeah. Uh, the, the, one of the number one things I would see with all clients when I would assess their diet, the average American just does not get enough protein and they definitely don't get enough protein to build substantial muscle. And then if you put that same person into a, a caloric restricted diet, they even eat even less. So you're it, you're you're doing something that suppresses the appetite that is beneficial for fat loss. But then if you're not eating uh, adequate protein, we're still in the same predicament. So yeah. what's funny about such this, a good point. And what's funny about this is somebody who really has trouble with um, cravings and appetite, who really wants to lose weight, they're listening to this and like, hey, that doesn't sound like a bad side effect. You know, it's going to make me want to eat less. But it's important. Uh, I'm so glad you said what you said because you got to keep that protein intake high to, you know, kind of maximize the muscle preserving effects. Well, and, and the things you guys are doing by instituting resistance exercises needs to be done or else they're going to lose muscle. You got to have some exercise. If you're going to do a GLP one, as I tell all our patients, if you're going to do a GLP one, you're going to lose muscle unless you do some type of resistance exercise, right. To main, to just help signal to maintain muscle mass. So but you have to get that protein in the best you can. And, and so it, it's a battle, but it's, but it can be done and you, you can get, you can get incredible body partitioning. I mean, incredible. Um, if you, if you know how to use these things appropriately and, and it's really, as you guys know, 
what works for one person doesn't work for the other person the same way. It's all, it's why you have to tailor everything you do to your client, to your patient and uh, in, in breaking through plateaus and losing weight, right. And getting stronger, all those things. I really appreciate your balanced um, mm -hmm. approach. Let's talk about, you had mentioned these kind of growth hormone releasing peptides or hormones like, um, Ipamerolin, there's Tessamerolin, there's a CJC1295 is another one. How do these, how do these work? And, um, and then what are their effects on the body with fat loss in particular? Okay. So you meant, so you mentioned, so what we, we look at these as growth hormone releasing hormone or growth hormone releasing peptide, which meaning, um, GHRHs are like what you refer to as tesamorlin or CJC1295, which is, which has been bastardized by the pharmacies and everything. CJC1295 really is not a real, it, it's, it should be modified 129, um, but that doesn't matter. It, let's just, let me focus on a GHRH is something that's produced by the hypothalamus that stimulates the anterior pituitary to start making growth hormone. It's a signal from the hypothalamus that signals the anterior pituitary, but the anterior pituitary does not release growth hormone right away based on that signaling. And actually the anterior pituitary, that secretagogue that's there that, that's, that we want to produce growth hormone is inhibited by something called somatostatin, which is another peptide. And that somatostatin increases as we age, it increases over stress, it increases with disease, it's, it, and it starts limiting the amount of growth hormone that could be released. Well, the ipamorlin that you brought up is a second, third generation GHRP, growth hormone releasing peptide, that is made, typically they're, they're referenced after, um, uh, there, uh, there, there are things that are actually released from the stomach um, that I'll, I can get into later, but um, that mimic that. And so, ipamorlin is something. What its job is to influence the anterior pituitary by what does it do? It inhibits somatostatin. It also increases the release of more growth hormone, releasing hormone from the hypothalamus to the pituitary. So. It increases the cur the, the 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 amount of growth hormone being made, but what it ensures is release of growth hormone within twenty to thirty minutes, which is really you mm -hmm. want to control when you release it. So taking a GHRH by itself um, is not the most efficient way to do it, anything. Um, and if you're really trying to work with cell function and, and it gets into more detail, but that's why like some more, uh, was one of the first GHRHs and it had good data and it had poor data based, but it was based on the fact that you couldn't control how it released growth hormone. Well, with the addition of a, um, uh, GHRP like if you can control that release. So that release of that growth hormone will happen within 20 to 30 minutes. And, you know, there's all kinds of things that people, you know, diet still influences when you use these peptides, you have to be aware of after you, you know, when you utilize, let's say you're going to do it, you, you know, most optimal times are morning and night when you start with these um, one morning, because um, it's the beginning of the day, beginning of the circadian clock, beginning of circadian rhythms, beginning of NAD production, which is all about this NMAPT, um, an enzyme that is necessary to produce and make NAD. So it, this is very important when you time these to make the most out of why growth hormone is important in circadian rhythms. So, and that being said, um, the, growth hormone release can be influenced by let's say you did an injection or you took up uh, an oral or or whatever um most of them have to be injectable though um of the ghrh ghrp like cjc and epimorlin together 
well, you got to make sure you don't have, you don't eat anything because if you eat some carbohydrate or fat, that will influence and blunt the response of what you just did. Um, pure protein's fine, but other things like that you can't do. So you have to understand the nutritional aspects of what influences and how these work. And that's why you get people who say, oh, this didn't do anything for me. I didn't get anything out of this. It's because they don't understand what they're doing or they take too much. They go over the saturation dosing of these things. So it just gets, it, 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 you know, there's a plethora of information you have to be aware of to, to really use these effectively. So when you use that, your second question was, how does it help with fat? Well, it's improving one of the main and incredible aspects of a growth hormone release is its influence. And the fact that these also these GHRHs and GHRPs have receptors that they work on the cell also to influence efficiencies. It improves basically that thing I talked about, about how glucose is better utilized through aerobic respiration, meaning it goes all the way through glycolysis and through mitochondrial respiration. And, and so you, and you're going to use fat. So it, it it influences that. And, um, and then, you know, just depending on, uh, the type of peptide you use to do that, um, there, which there are others, um, you can be very effective in, in working on not just improving fat loss, but by you're improving these mechanisms called AMPK. AMPK is all about improving autophagy of a cell, clean the cell up, make things better, then down the road, you get IGF-1 production, and that leads to muscle protein synthesis. So you get part of autophagy, cl cell cleaning, improved AMPK production, and then you get the mTOR effects down the, you know, downstream of protein synthesis and so forth. So really fascinating stuff that makes such a difference in, in improving health and, and maintaining, giving people the ability to to maintain their youth or maintain their ability to train. I, I mean, I'm 61 and I train better than I did in my 20s, 30s, 40s, or 50s, and I haven't stopped yet. And it's because of optimizing cell function, it's optimizing nutrition, it's optimizing sleep, stress, and training, right? It's which is all physics. You know, it all comes down to force mass acceleration and all those issues, but you guys, that's what you do. It, so it sounds like these peptides by themselves already improve the cell's function and have great benefits by themselves. Added with good diet and training, it just it compounds. If I'm understanding correctly, no matter what, just taking a lot of these peptides have their benefits by themselves. But if added with a, a, a diet that's appropriate with them, in addition to strength training, it sounds like that's where you see this like kind of mind blowing type of results from it. Yeah. So, so and that's that's a really good observation. It, it, and I'm I'm sorry if I talk expansive in all of this. I, I really I, I I try to. That's a that's a really good message that I can send to you guys to let you know. Like in my field of where I work with very severely ill and people, you know, post COVID fatigue, all, all of these incredibly um, complicated autoimmune issues, um, metabolic issues. These peptides are phenomenal because yes, they help with efficiencies. They help us get to where we can start improving problems that have occurred that may be structural or who, who knows what in the cell. But when you have, when you can take the next step and start improving nutrition and then you're getting healthier and then i get them into an exercise program which is the end stage right because those people can't do that at the beginning it's incredible how they all come together to to maximize efficiencies of the cell so your observation is absolutely correct and so in healthier people who are just looking to optimize you know training and that that's where this all comes together you know nutrition and and uh sleep is just as important though and uh stress release relief and uh and exercise and the right type of exercise you you can't uh if you're not going to do resistance training i i just tell people why are you training then i mean it's it's you you cardiac's great but you have to have resistance training because 
resistance training. This is where all the information is going to explode also about how we keep seeing all of these new myokines and exokines that are being, which are peptides that are produced by muscle by working on resistance type of training. And it, it only makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, it's just wonderful to see where this is all going and to see things like you guys are doing. I mean, these questions you're asking are awesome. I, this, this is what people should be, they, uh, they should be seeking this out and um and and looking to for the and knowing that there are answers out there to, to help them optimize their lives you would really appreciate uh sal wrote a book two years ago well it's been almost three years now called the resistance training revolution and you're you're highlighting some of the points that he makes in the book so i think you'd really enjoy that now i'm going to ask you to do something i know is going to be challenging for you because i know i understand how your mind works within all these the all these great peptides that are out there in your experience um you know if i if i asked you to like you know give me the top three to five that you think seem to be the most beneficial for most people and i know we we all know here in this room that there's such a wide individual variance and you could say one's great but then for that person it's not the best but generally speaking when you look at you know all the patients that you've helped as a whole what seem to be like the big bangers so your question is very similar to the questions i get from all my physicians i teach around the world <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> i feel better about it then <laughs> <laughs> it's like i feel i you know it's so funny you get done after a two-day seminar you worked your ass off you just spit out all this information and then you get somebody raises their hand and said this was wonderful but can you tell me your <laughs> can you sum it up <laughs> give me your top three and you're, you're just like what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> to, to, and, to make you feel good about it though that's a i think that's kudos to how well and non-biased you are about explaining the information i could tell just by the way you communicate it that you're very careful uh, about all the nuances. So, and I think that when you probably do these, people are, respect your opinion and they just purely want to hear what is your opinion yeah. looking at the general pop? What do you see are like your personal favorites that are helping people? Sure. Um, well, I appreciate the question and thank you for the um, observations. Um, I want to just say I'm respectfully humble of everything. I mean, I make all the mistakes everybody else makes. I'm, I'm just, I just happen to have a little bit more knowledge on, on something than you, you guys know. You can, you do your work, you do your research, you can be just as smart as anybody else. And I've just been fortunate that I've been doing this for 40 years and I just know a little bit more. So that, that, that separates me a bit more, but it's all about, right? You got to put the effort in, you got to do all these things to make things happen. And, um, so coming back to that question, uh, I'd say, the, the the top one's got to be BPC-157 mm -hmm. and BPC-157 has just been, it's an incredible peptide based on, and I'm going to tell you, you know, there's, there's, there's multiple pathways that BPC does not have a direct pathway. It has all these indirect pathways and in how it works. And it's a, it's a synthetic peptide that actually mimics something that's made in the stomach. It's, I know we refer to it and say that it's directly made from the stomach, but it really isn't. It's a, it's something that's synthesized. It's very similar to a peptide that's made by the gut. That's a repair type of peptide. But basically what I love about BPC-157 is, is the versatility of how many, it, because it's all about repair and restoration of, of tissue that has to do with so much in disease states, you know, uh, if you think about bad microbiomes and you guys might think of it as, you know, I hate the term, but leaky gut or bad cell integration and leaky brain, um, blood brain barriers. And BPC plays such a role in, in extracellular matrix function, which is a whole nother topic, a huge topic actually in recovery repair and hypertrophy and muscle building. That, that's where if you want to focus on where the research is, it's extracellular matrix. And that's my big focus is extracellular matrix of where you all these signaling agents have to go from cell to cell and outside and they follow these actin, myosin, these these filaments. And, and it's how cells rebuild. They got to follow all these little filaments, these pathways. And BPC has 
an incredible effect on improving extracellular matrix. And that's a big thing that goes bad in everybody in pH problems and as you age, extra, it's all about extracellular matrix. So, and, and BPC increases growth hormone receptors um, on the cells. So it influences those other things we talked about to, to be better, um, improves nitric oxide production. It, it has, has multitudes of pathways of how it works. And it's, so you've got, it's a it's a multi-modality peptide that I just love with I have used it for oh my gosh since it was first well let's say this I've used it for a very long time and I've never seen a side effect with BPC 157. That's a pretty incredible statement to yeah. say about a peptide and not see a side effect. Um and I I just think it's got just so much um it's just got so many good things and and the most incredible thing about this peptide and I, and i've i've had great discussions with the, the gentleman who uh, uh who actually synthesized this peptide and um in croatia he he has the patent on it and developed it and um great we've shared a lot of science together but this peptide has basically minimal clinical evidence behind it's all based on animal studies and we have very few clinical studies but we have a few now we have some that are in in in, in act you know that are active but you'd think we'd have a lot more on this peptide and its versatility and how it's used in 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 different disease states um again that has to come down to money and and you know where can where can these companies make their money and um, they can't make it with BPC-157 because it's out there. Um, so that's it. So BPC-157, I like a lot. I love, I like Selenc, um, which is a nasal, it can be introduced as a nasal. The BPC-157 is typically injectable, but can be PO. Um, it, and that's a whole nother discussion about that. But the, I like Selenc because of its influence on brain derived neurotropic factor and how it just works on you know seems to be anxiety is one of the biggest problems that we're seeing a lot of in disease states and in in just life and selenic has an it has really a nice place in working on efficiencies not just the body but specifically in the brain to improve this brain derived neurotropic factor which has a tremendous influence on cell neuroplasticity in the brain and cognitive executive function and just dealing with the world basically in a way that's manageable for everyone um so i love that i love selling i love its immune properties um it's it's got immune modulation properties which are tremendous so i would say that and then i would say probably the the ghrhs and ghrps are just they're a platform to build from because everybody you know I, no matter who you are from the time you're 30 and and then as life progresses you're producing less alpha ketoglutarate you're producing less nad your mitochondrial function is declining you're 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 producing you're utilizing less fat oxidation um you're increasing uh glucose tolerance you're increasing insulin resistance is there anything out there that can work on so many levels in influencing the progression of something i've just called aging which is the number one you know it's the number one influencer of any disease right it, the older you get the more likely you are to have any of these diseases uh, glaucoma sarcoma or, uh, uh, sarcopenia, diabetes, uh, heart disease, brain disease, you know, anything you want to say. Well, these GHRHs and GHRPs are just, I think, are phenomenal in how you can alter that course of life and efficiencies of the cell. And then, uh, and so that's four. Um, you want five. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would say, um, five, I'd have to say probably thymolin. It'd be either thymolin or epitalon. Um, thymolin is, is just an incredible immune modulator. And I'm, it's, you know, 
what what is weight training what is adaption what is what is it all about with muscle uh rebuilding and regeneration it's all about the immune system if the immune system's not functioning if that macrophage isn't there as there's muscle regeneration or muscle hypertrophy and there are phase changes in the macrophage that have to occur and in the fibrocyte and in the satellite cell above the sarcolemma if you don't have these things functioning right i don't care you're not rebuilding shit. and you and again it all comes down to efficiencies of how those cells work and these glp1s and uh, i'm sorry these uh th these uh thymolins and how they help with immune you know keeping an immune cell in the proper phase when it needs to be remember what i said how a cell is naturally intelligent it just wants the signaling agents to help it make the decision when it needs to perfect example you know people talk about well we got an immune boost well that's total bullshit. nobody you can't <laughs> you boost, you boost the immune system and you're gonna you're gonna screw up your immune system it's about immune modulation it's about keeping it in sync right mm. and that's thymolin allows through many different pathways that activation of these immune cells to communicate appropriately so i'd say thymolin is a is is probably that would be what how many did i give you, you so that's, far? You, that's you, five five that's five yeah, right you, there you did it you did Perfect. it <laughs> <laughs> dr seeds uh, uh really appreciate yeah. your balanced um approach and how you communicate and, and this really reminds me of why it's so important that people go through a doctor when they when they're using peptides because i know you can go online you can find peptides through kind of some gray market or you know kind of area but I mean, these have real effects on the body, and um, you know, I just want to stress: you probably, you, you definitely want to work with a doctor who knows what they're doing when you're using these these substances. And I'm sure you would agree. Whoa, my gosh! Yeah, yeah it's all anything online is total bullshit. I mean, it you have no idea; they haven't been third party tested. You don't know have they been tested for for infection? You know, are they have they followed all the standards of what we? Why you spend this money for something? Absolutely not. And and I've I've had the I, I mean I I've gosh I used to present the data of where I test those online products and show the docs. This is what you're giving to your patient. Oh, are, are you oh, wow. are you crazy? Oh, you know wow. because of the because none of them had maybe if they did they had 50 60 percent of what they were really supposed to. But so think about this. Here's the best way to think about this. A peptide has to be 99.8% or 99.6%, which is the low point of what it says it is. Okay. It has to be that full peptide because when you take this peptide, what happens is it's, it gets hydrolyzed. It, it breaks these, the, the peptide itself to some degree, it stays intact or it breaks up into its biological components. Well, if you have a peptide that's not pure, you have fragments that are breaking off that are peptides that you have no idea what they're doing. Oh, they could wow. be hepatotoxic. They can be cancerous. They can be, they can be anything. And, and I've shown that in, in, in looking through, uh, um, um, specific testing where you can look at the levels of what's, what's in this peptide. It's, it's insane and it's dangerous. And that's why you, you gotta be really smart. Um, Wow, you uh, just you just said something that's so important in regards to that. You know, like uh, it's very popular for people to go online and and buy testosterone on the black market, and probably the biggest risk there, aside from some of the you know really ridiculous things, is just probably getting it watered down. But you could give somebody who's claiming it's two hundred fifty milligrams testosterone, one hundred twenty five milligrams testosterone, and they'll still feel it, and it'll still have some positive effects. But what you're saying, if this thing isn't 99.6% of what it says it is, it's not only probably not working, but the adverse effects. Yeah. yeah. That's, you have no idea. It could have all kinds of weird you effects. Just, you just can't water this shit down and sell it. It doesn't work the same way. Well, well, here, it's kind of like what you said, but the, here's the bigger problem is having 50% of that peptide in there and, you know, works and the people feel it and they say oh it's working but it's that other 50 percent that's doing you have no 
you have no idea what it's doing to your DNA, what it's doing to, to create more what we call cell senescence, which is what's happening. You're causing premature aging. You're doing things that you have no idea are going to screw you up for the rest of your life that we're going to have a very difficult problem fixing down the road if you if you stay consistent with that type of, uh, of care. But the bigger things are what we see with like hepatotoxicity and what, what happens um, they're horrible. It's, it's horrible to, to see these things that occur. Well, appreciate you coming on the show, Dr. Seeds. This was yeah. awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Super enlightening. Thanks. I have, I have actually, I had a blast talking to you guys. I like you, you guys are, uh, I, I'm going to have to check you out. I'm sure you guys do some, you had all the right questions. I, I love talking about things that, that you, I could tell all of you have a passion for what you do. And well, that's, that's awesome. We also have something in common. You that's actually great. opened up this conversation with, uh, your, your priorities and ours are the same way. So we're mm -hmm. all fathers and we talk about fatherhood number one first for us. And then all the other stuff falls into order. So yeah. we have that in common too. So we're, would, we're definitely going to try and have very, you back very on. Aligned with you. Yeah. We're going to fly you out next time. So I hope you have the time. Get we'll, you out in California here. Come in the studio. Yeah. This has been great. Yeah. Well, well, let me, let me finish with this one thing. You guys will love this then. So all my kids, like when my kids want to come find me, when we want to have a family discussion, it's the garage is our weight room. And so my mm -hmm. kids learn very young, you know, proper technique, all the right things, but they learned that life was handled in the weight room. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love that. Beautiful. That's awesome. Thanks again, That's Dr. So awesome, Seeds. Doc. Thank you. It was great meeting you. All right. Uh, nice to meet all you guys. Be good. Thank there you. you too. Have a good day. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique.